Coming up on Shoppers Politics. I mean, I've got to share some news here with listeners. I mean, I don't know what they're going to make of this. I hope you hope you're sitting down at home, wherever you're listening to this. But you've given up the booze, Nigel Farage. I know that was the old me. I'm Christopher Hope, chopper to my pals, the Telegraph's associate editor, politics, and welcome to Chopper's Politics. And I hope you've had a marvellous Christmas and New Year break. Better at least than our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. He's had to cope with increasing rumblings and grumblings about his leadership of late. First, the revelation about parties in 10 Downing Street when the rest of us were locked down. Not a good look. And this week, the PM's response to fears about an impending fuel crisis have been labelled unconservative. Well, by me at least. Oh dear. One part of the country that Boris Johnson will be keen to keep sweet in the upcoming months are the so-called new blue wall seats. My first guest on this week's podcast, the first of 2022, thinks the PM may well have a fight on his hands. In fact, my interviewee shouldn't really be a guest at all because he's meant to have retired from politics, at least twice, I think, on the last count. But it seems he can't quite get enough. So he joins me once again in his spiritual home, the Red Lion Pub. I'm talking, of course, about Nigel Farage, the former UKIP and Brexit Party leader. This is is part of your past life. This is politics. You're you're now a broadcaster. I know. So why are you here? Why are you on this pub? Who has booked him? Why is is Nigel Farage (laughs) in this pub? I tell you why. You're not meant to do politics anymore. Because I've got a story to tell you that's really interesting. And it's a story that no one's noticed. But once again... London, the London political class and the media class, that's yes, you. Yes, that's me, point at me, yes. You haven't spotted something. There's something remarkable going on. And it's almost, it, it's not quite a direct comparison, but I'm seeing shades of what happened 10 years ago. February 2011, I'm leader of UKIP. There's a by-election in Barnsley Central. Rock solid Labour territory. The opinion polls show UKIP on 2%. We'd come 5th in that seat in the general election. And I got to Barnsley, and I noticed something was actually happening on the ground. No one spotted it, no one understood it, and yet, come the results, UKIP get 12% of the vote and come second. It was the first by-election we'd ever come second in. From that moment, we came second in every by-election and finished up winning a couple of by-elections. The beginning of the insurgency proper was in Barnsley, and this was where People had just had enough of the Labour Party. Yeah. It wasn't speaking to them on immigration, which they'd seen a massive change in their own town. It was miles away from them in terms of how they felt about EU membership. But there was something deeper. The feeling that the Labour Party just didn't represent the things that they believed in, the things that their families had done for generations. And the Conservatives, under Osborne and Cameron, weren't saying any of those things either. So that was what happened. Let's go to where we are today. We have a Conservative leadership who kind of promised in 2019 that because of Brexit, this was a new kind of politics. And Boris portrayed himself very much in a populist light, I would suggest. And it was highly effective. But two years in to his premiership, we see the same phenomenon. They are coming up with ideas and policies that delight people in a few postcodes in central London. Uh, the Green Agenda, perhaps being a very, very Rewilding good example. is the thing this week. Rewilding. I mean, don't even start me on that. I mean, the idea we're going to pay farmers millions to basically let the place go to rack and ruin. Farmers and rich landowners. I mean... It's always rich landowners. Mm. It's always the same with wind farms. It's always rich landowners. And, of course, so, so therefore we produce less food in our own country, which increases air miles. I can't work that bit out, but never mind. But these are all ideas that are utterly, utterly remote from ordinary folk. The whole net zero agenda, which is massively disadvantaging British business. And I've been banging on about this since 2013, but people hadn't really noticed. Now that bills are going through the roof, they are noticing. So you've got a Tory party in number 10 that looks very similar to the one 10 years ago. It's the old Etonians, it's the posh boys, it's the chumocracy, it's back. And it's not connecting with those voters. So here's the interesting thing. Boris has had a very torrid time as Prime Minister. He's not even vaguely Conservative. It's big state. There's no connection with the self-employed. There's no connection with the strivers, the strugglers, white van man, plumbers, plasterers, folk that are doing their damnedest to try and uh, improve their lot. 
But you've also seen the immigration thing. It's back. Again, London doesn't notice. Edward Lee got up in the House of Commons this week and mentioned immigration. The groans in the House. It was, I mean, he was about as popular as I used to be in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. You can't discuss this in London. Out there, they thought they were voting Brexit and they thought they were voting Johnson to take back control of our borders, not to surrender the English Channel to criminal trafficking gangs. So you've got all these things that are happening, but then you've got Johnson himself. And frankly, he has not come across as being straight and honest over the parties. You know, I mean, and this started with Cummings, didn't it, really, with Barnard Castle. I mean, do you know what? If they said, hey, guys, we were under pressure, we had a few drinks after work, uh, we shouldn't have done, we're sorry. Like, put your hands up. Do you know what people would say? Well, actually, we broke lockdown rules as well. You know, but it's, it's this pretense. So confidence in him is going. So last Sunday, there were two big opinion polls that were published. One got noticed and one didn't. The one that got noticed was Delta Poll, and that showed a 16-point lead for Starmer's Labour Party in the red wall seats, those crucial seats. That's alarming for the Tories. Which is very alarming for the Tories. But there's something even more alarming for the Tories, and it's this. Focal data. Their poll was a 25,000-person poll done across constituencies all around the United Kingdom at the end of December. And if you drill into those numbers, you find something fascinating. You find, just as UKIP was rising without anyone noticing in 2011, Reform UK, the successor to the Brexit Party, led by Richard Tice, of which I am the honorary president <laughs> with no executive function. But you suddenly see something. That Barnsley Central seat, in which we got 12% all those years ago as UKIP, Reform UK is now showing 15% there. If you go across the Red Wall seats, yes. you know, go through the Doncaster seats. Well, I'm looking now here at Bassett yep. Lord, 10%, yep. Barnsley Central, 15%, Barnsley East, Which the Tories 15%. took at the last election. Yep. Yeah, and it goes on. A right. bolso over 10%. Yeah, these are reform numbers, despite the fact yep. that the party has, I mean, you know, and I invented the name. I wanted it to be the successor to the Brexit party, given that Brexit's done. It has not had a huge amount of publicity. It hasn't managed to raise, as yet, a large sum of money. It's not been very high profile, and yet voters are finding it for themselves. Can you imagine what Reform UK is going to do when it does start to raise its profile. And it lacks that, that kind of visceral sovereignty appeal which UKIP gave voters, the, the, the flag and all yes, that kind of thing. Yes, it does. I agree with that, Chris. But there's something else happening here. What it is actually tapping into is the disconnect with London. On all of these issues, I've mentioned cross-channel illegal migration. I've mentioned green taxes, and we'll come back to that perhaps in a bit more detail. But you've got the Conservatives talking in a language that nobody understands, and they frankly don't believe them when they say they're going to solve the Channel crisis, and Starmer providing zero opposition, agreeing with all of it. So I think it's because of the disconnect. That's why reform is polling in these numbers. So the reason that Starmer is 16 points ahead in the red wall seats is not because there is a sudden burst of enthusiasm for Starmer, which you might have thought reading the Sunday newspapers actually it's because of that reform. Who's amongst journalists, I imagine? I mean, Starmer's a kind of leader, which journalists might, might think could, could run this country, you know, is a kind of acceptable face of Labour. Corbyn wasn't. I get that point. He's not scary. He's just not frightening. In fact, he may be even to the right of Boris Johnson in many areas. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, who's to say? But if he, he mentioned brief, just briefly there the, the issue of, um, of uh, energy bills and the cost of living crisis. We were staggered. That, that, that the answer to that question, why won't you cut the VAT off, yes. off taxi? Boris Johnson said it was, it would be, um, I think it was a, a clumsy way of dealing with or worse that effect. I, well, what he's saying that is, is tax, that is what tax cuts yeah, are. What he's saying is if you take the 5% VAT off, off our energy bills, that actually some better off people get that as well. So what you say, if, so if you go the other <laughs> Therefore, way... Therefore, never ever cut taxes again. Well, well, you'd never cut middle class taxes, ever. You would never cut taxes for anybody earning... I think 40000 a year is now considered to be well off. I mean, if you're living in London, I can promise you it isn't. So actually what you do, if you take that argument on tax cuts, you then go for the socialist argument, which is the state then intervenes and takes some of that money and gives it to those at the which lower end of the scale. I think. Which, which is probably which what's going to happen. But, but, but I mean, there is a massive administrative but cost But do you see that. the VAT row on, on fuel a kind of stitch-up by the main party. So we're rowing about 5%. I when in is, fact, the real there, issue... There is a much bigger what issue. What is the big issue? Yeah, on, I, mean, on, I, mean, I mean, look, two points to make on that. Number one, it couldn't have been clearer. Removing the 5% 
was a UKIP policy for 10 years. Became government policy. <laughs> Gove and Johnson, Gove and Johnson and Cummings picked it up in the yeah, referendum. Voting policy. Yeah, fine, good. They go into government basically promising they'll do it. He's got a chance here to say to the country, look what Brexit's done for you, and he's not taking it. But the real issue is they can go hammer and tongs on the 5%. Everybody can talk about the 5% in London. But let's please not talk about the slightly more awkward, rather more embarrassing side of this, which is that on everybody's electricity bill, you've got the 5% VAT. But on top of that, 25% surcharge on every family's electricity bill in the name of green subsidies. And when you actually drill down on how some of the money is spent, well, much of it goes, of course, has been going for the last few years to rich landowners. A lot of it goes to huge foreign companies, which I think if people realise that, they wouldn't be thrilled. But even that money is used to subsidise, for example, the Drax plant up in Yorkshire, who burn trees. I mean, the whole thing's nuts. Well, how, how, playing it all again. I mean, we literally we are back in now in November 2013 when David Cameron allegedly said, get rid of all the green crap on yeah. fuel bills. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the problem is as we get older, Nigel Farage, we get greyer. Yeah. Um, but the whole playbook is replaying itself. Oh, we've seen it all before. <laughs> we've seen it all before. Now, here's the point. Here's the point. I was successful a decade ago in waking people up to what EU membership was and what it cost. I was successful a decade ago in waking people up to the fact that EU membership meant unlimited numbers could come to the country. What I was not successful with, I never really made people understand how much they were paying on their bills in the form of green subsidy. I tried, I couldn't connect. And the reason was, bills were relatively cheap. Now that bills are becoming very, very expensive, it's a debate. So my argument is this. Reform is already beginning to start a new revolt on the right. Previous revolts on the right ousted David Cameron and Theresa May from office. And if Boris Johnson isn't very careful, this will oust him too. If Richard Tice is able to get to those red wall seats, to get the 25% into the public domain as a debate, people will go bonkers. And you're here doing it. Uh, of course, you're, you've written a piece of the Telegraph in which you say, yes. for now... I am the party's president in a non-executive role, but I intend to increase the help I'm giving to Richard Tice. Yes, absolutely. I mean, look. But you keep retiring. I mean, then, then you're back. <laughs> well, you're I, like I, a yo-yo. I, well, I, look, you know, Chris, I've said for over a quarter of a century, I don't really want or need to do any of this. I've got loads but of... But you other... love it, don't you? <laughs> you oh, can't stay I, away I, I from can't this. deny that. I mean, I wouldn't love it. I couldn't lie in front of the court to, to that particular question. But no, I mean, I honestly thought when we finally had got Brexit over the line, yeah. that we actually were going to get a Conservative government. You know, I, and I thought we would get something. And it just is turning out to be the hugest disappointment. Richard Tice is putting his heart and soul into this. I am helping him. Will um, it help him? Because you're such a big figure in politics. So, I mean, you might outshine him and then... You might no, be I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, you know, get up on centre stage on public platforms or all the rest of it. But I am... I don't see why I shouldn't, as, as the party president... You know, make the arguments as to what's going on out there. And I think, if I'm, if I'm honest with you, Chris, I think once this interview and the piece in the paper gets out, there's going to be a great awakening that actually something is happening out there. And if I can help that process, yeah. I'm more than happy to. I mean, look, Boris could, of course, save himself. So, you know, he could get tough on the channel. All right, we'll be condemned by the UN and everything else, but he could. He could decide, you know what, whatever we think about CO2 and global warming... You know, COP26 proves something. China's ignoring it. India's ignoring it. You know, all the big countries, frankly, are ignoring it. We can't beggar Britain when the rest of the world isn't, isn't playing. And if he was to do those things, he might save himself. Here's the funny thing. Starting in 2011, going through to 2014, when we get two MPs defect, we get Conservative chairmen all over the country defect, uh, 22 former Tory MPs join UKIP. The Tory backbenchers were restless, but they remain loyal. This Tory party in the House of Commons is totally different. Particularly the Red Wall ones. I mean, if you you look at these new MPs Mm. that have come in, I mean, I I actually call it the UKIPization of the Tory party. You've got former minors. You've got very, very different. You know, these are not your posh, shire, stuck-up, which many of them are, conservatives. These are real, 
Roll your sleeves up. this group you're describing who are getting anxious and looking into the election. And when this group see, when this group see what reform is doing in their constituencies... Are you in talks with any of them about about coming over? uh, That's premature. That's premature. You know, I mean, frankly, these data sets that we're discussing now, this is the first time this has really surfaced. And we'll see where we go with it. Uh, I'm not going to make any predictions on that score. But what I will say is they will be far less tolerant of Johnson than the backbenchers were of Cameron 10 years On those data sets, we have, we have, obviously, it's a, it's a, is it 25,000 strong survey? Across the country, yeah. So then it's a few, a few hundred or even less yeah, than that in each seat. So the, we are really a lot, aren't we, into These are numbers. not big samples, and yet there's an extraordinary consistency of the results. You know, take Battersea, Lambeth, you know, big Remain voting Labour areas, and you'll see consistently reforms on about 3%. Go to Essex and Kent, you'll see it's on 7 or 8 Go to the red wall and it's double digits. So they may be small samples per constituency, yeah. but they're producing a remarkably consistent result. I mean, I've got to share some news here with listeners. I mean, I don't know what they're going to make of this. I hope you're sitting down at home, wherever you're listening to this, but you've given up the booze, Nigel Farage. I know. That was the old me. That was the old Because <laughs> you're, you're half the man you were. No, what, I, what are you up to? I, do you know, and I haven't made a big noise about it until now, but I just thought, do you know what? I'm going to do dry January. And when I worked in Mississippi, we used to try and do it every year. But by about the fifth, we'd always collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sixth today. But uh, no, I, I, I just thought quietly to myself before Christmas, actually, do you know what? Just a little bit of a break. Not a bad thing to do. And an interesting test yourself, you know, of where you are with it. And uh, I can report, you know, it's the sixth. Fine. No, no problem <laughs> you haven't got at the shakes. all. No, well, you'll notice, Chris. I mean, I, you know, I've lost two stone. And I've kind of realised... I'm getting older. I, for the f- sort of first time ever, I've got to start being a bit responsible. Is there a third act in the political life of Nigel Farage? I don't know. I doubt it. I mean, if we had a different system, there would be. If we had an American-style system that was open, with open primaries, uh, then I would absolutely. In America, anybody can say, right, I'm going to run to be governor of Florida. I'm going to run to be president. I mean, when Trump put his name forward in 15... He wasn't a member of the, of the Republicans. Was wasn't, even, wasn't even a member of the party. And it was considered, considered the biggest joke. Our system is very, very closed. So I, I, I think that perhaps gives you the answer that you want. It's a very difficult thing to do. I've led, I've been involved with insurgent parties for a quarter of a century. I've enjoyed doing it. I'm pleased I've done it. But it's a heck of a tough thing to do. And it comes at a massive cost. And I mean a massive, massive cost. Do I really want to do that again? Not particularly. But do I want to be active in politics? Do I want to be influential uh, in terms of public debate? Do I want to try and point my finger at things that are happening and nobody else is seeing, which is why I'm sitting here with you now? Yes, and I'll do that, and I'll do my bit on GB News to do that. So, I mean, there's no way I'm leaving the sphere of public debate, of broadcasting, of journalism. It's absolutely in my blood. Uh, But do I want to go back into effectively the front lines <laughs> not particularly but never say never well Nigel Farage once again back in the Red Lion pub thank you for joining us this <laughs> thank week you. and happy new year on Chopper's Politics thank and to you. you and to all of your listeners and I'm sure that's not the last you'll be hearing from Nigel Farage listeners if so apologies in advance stay with us listeners in just one moment we'll be returning to a subject touched on by Nigel there the massive increase coming up in fuel bills Right after this. I'm Jazz, part of the audio team here at The Telegraph, and I want to let you know about a new podcast series we've been working on. It's called Eyewitnessed History and brings to life moments the world changed told by the people who were there. It was like a beautiful summer's day. Join The Telegraph's top journalists as they take you inside the day they witnessed history. I know I just heard this enormous. I was in New York on 9-11. Search for Eyewitness History wherever you're listening to this. Now, not to bring you back down to reality too soon after what I hope was a great festive break for you all, but this week, consumer expert Martin Lewis warned the government that households are going to take a seismic hit in their bills this year. The government's energy price cap is due to be revised in February, with any increase affecting household bills in April. It's led to concerns, not unreasonably I think, that some families will have to heat or eat. 
And one idea popular amongst a growing number of Tory MPs is axing the VAT charge on domestic fuel bills. And it's got the backing of an MP who commands attention in government for being ahead of the curve on dealing with issues affecting so-called blue wall Tory voters. The MP for Stevenage, Stephen McPartland. And Stephen joins me now. Stephen, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Hi, Chris. Great to see you. It's lovely Good to be to see here. You. Fellow Scouts, so great to have you on. Thanks for joining us. You're one of the few Tory MPs I think who Number 10 looked to, and you have been over the, over the years in your campaigning. They see you as a kind of uh, someone who, who knows what people need in, in the so called, um, you know, the, the working class Tory vote. You're a canary in the mine, and when you start chirping, Number 10 should be worried. And you're worried right now, aren't you, about fuel bills? Yeah, I mean, um, I often see myself a little bit as an early warning system. I often tell the whips I vote for things before it's fashionable for the rest of the party to do so. In terms of energy bills, at the moment, there's a huge concern about what's going to happen when the energy price cap falls later this year. I think it's February they're talking about at the moment. From my point of view, people are talking about average bills possibly going up by £700. And oddly enough, Chris, I actually think the Labour Party's got it a bit wrong on this. And the government are also um, not fully understanding what the issue is. So there's a lot of talk at the moment about scrapping um, VAT on energy prices. Now, you know, I'm a conservative that's always been interested in working families, always been interested in people who are trying to make their way in the world and always been trying to support people who are on squeezed incomes. And I know people are talking about scrapping VAT on energy. Now, it's currently at 5%. If you scrap VAT on energy, you're going to be saving people less than £10 a month. Now, I think you should scrap VAT on energy purely because it's actually not a luxury. You shouldn't be paying VAT on it. Now, we've not been able to do that because we've been in Europe. We're no longer in Europe, so we could, as a Brexit dividend, scrap that 5% VAT. But in terms of helping people, to, we've got to find a way of smoothing out this massive volatility in the wholesale price of gas. And if you're talking about bills going up £700 in February if the price cap ends, you know, 8 eight to £10 a month is not going to make that much of a difference for people. Why do you think that we're talking about VAT if it's only £10 a month, which is which is which could be a lot of money for someone on a very low income, but isn't isn't that that much compared to um, average incomes? Why are we worrying about it? Why are we not talking about, say, uh, the green levies. Now, on this podcast, Nigel Farrell has talked about the issue of, of green levies and how that's a much bigger take of the bill. Why not Why not deal with that and and say, right, we're going to put those on pause. We have to get to net zero by 2050, et cetera, et cetera. But for now, we're going to take off these green levies off bills. So I think the issue is it's a massive lack of understanding, um, you know, when you're talking about VAT and the green levy. So, you know, people will say, you know, eight, ten pound a month is a lot of money for people on very low incomes. But they're then ignoring the fact that that if it's going up by £700 in February, taking a £10 a month off is not helping them at all. Actually helping them not go up by £700 in February is what we should be aiming to do. We should be aiming to smooth out that volatility in the energy market. And there are ways of doing it. In terms of green levies, again, you know, it's the easy answer to say, well, you know, let's get rid of all this green stuff and, um, you know, we won't invest in this. But things like the winter fuel discount, which a lot of people on low incomes rely on, are, are paid for out of those green levies. So if they're saying scrap green levies, they're saying scrap the winter fuel discount. And, you know... There's a lot of problems around that as well. It's, it's a big chunk of an electricity bill. It's 25.5 percent, and that, and if you dealt with that now, you'd you deal with the big issue, the big issue over cost of cost of living crisis coming towards the Tories as early as next month. I think the difficulty with this is that's just an easy answer. It's somebody wanting to pull a big lever and be done on it. So if you basically get rid of all the green stuff, it's the same. If you've got an energy bill of, say, roughly £1,200 a year, getting rid of 25% of it's £300. But people are still going to be six, £700 worse off if energy bills are going up by £700 in February. So the key is fixing the volatility in the energy market. And that means that we actually need to look at the energy market and the companies themselves and think, you know, how can we help them? How can they help themselves? Is it a short term credit crisis? Do we need to talk about providing some kind of credit facility so that, you know, they can borrow 20, 25 billion pound off government Bank of England and um, then use that to smooth out the volatility? That's a long term. That's a long term way of dealing with it, with it, isn't it, Steve? Though I mean, the immediate short term is February. We could do this in February. Could you? So that, that's what my point is. In February, we could be providing this facility now and be out there saying that, you know, we're going to stabilise the volatility in the energy market by 
stepping in, providing this safety net and um, allowing them to smooth it out over the next 12, 18 months, two, three years. So we could fix it. And I think the problem is the Labour Party, people like Nigel Farage, they're all saying, no, get rid of the green, get rid of the VAT because it'll create a great headline. I agree. Get rid of VAT because, any, you know, you shouldn't be paying VAT on energy anyway. It's, you know, it's not a luxury. It's a necessity. So we shouldn't be paying VAT on it. So do it for that reason. Don't do it because you think it's going to solve the cost of living. It's going to solve the um, increase in energy prices. I'm trying to say I'm bothered about the £700 increase coming down the line in February for average households, whereas saying, oh, we'll save £8 a month by scrapping VAT, it's an easy win wanting to pull a big lever, and that's not what we're about. We should be about trying to actually step in there and work out how we can help these families, not how we can get a good headline. What did you think when you heard Boris Johnson in his press conference in Number 10 Downing Street this week say, give a, a rather strange answer to the question from The Sun, Harry Cole there, asking why we can't cut um, VAT, given that was a promise at the 2016 uh, EU referendum? You know, that was a COVID press conference. He was trying to persuade people to get out there and get the boosters. And you can understand why he doesn't particularly want to get drawn on this issue in that arena. But, but, but the, the, the answer was interesting. He, he called all tax cuts blunt instruments. I mean, if a Tory PM doesn't believe in tax cuts because they're so-called blunt instruments, what does he believe in? Any tax cut by its nature is a blunt instrument. And it, it just seems I thought there was a question mark about his entire commitment to conservatism in that answer. I'm a rebel, Chris, and you're making me <laughs> the Prime Minister. I think... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in, ter- in terms of the Prime Minister and Boris Johnson, you know, I genuinely think he believes in lower taxes. I mean, of course, a tax cut is a blunt instrument in the sense of, you know, um, if you do 1%, on income tax, you know, it helps um, lots and lots of people who would not necessarily need as much help on energy bills as everybody else. But I think, you know, it's probably taken a little bit out of context because he was expecting questions on COVID and the booster rollout. And so I think, you know, it's a little bit more around that. You know, my priority is making sure that the government is in a position where we can step in and provide practical help to families come February. If you think of the cohort you're talking about, these, these kind of um, blue collar Tories, it, well, what do they make, do you think, of the government's agenda? I mean, we're seeing the levelling up white paper delayed. The early leaks aren't, aren't very impressive about so-called kind of governors for rural areas. He's not taking action as he might do to help to help the poor areas over VAT and fuel. Um, there's a, a feeling of a chumocracy. That's only what Nigel Farage thinks about the Tory party. Is that worrying you? Um, I think, you know, you look at what's happening on the ground. You know, in my constituency, I've had a new hospital built. Schools have been rebuilt. GB surgery is rebuilt. You know, r- realistically, there is a lot going on. I think there's a nervousness amongst some of our northern colleagues about, you know, um, getting projects and shovels in the ground to actually help those areas between now and the next two, three years. I, I get that frustration. It's, a lot of things seem to take a long time. But I think, you know, overall, in terms of levelling up, I don't mind the white paper being delayed because I'd rather the white paper actually be something that's real and practical instead of blue sky thinking. You know, I've got this big campaign nationally around the building safety crisis. I think the building safety crisis, that, that's a good way of levelling up these areas, places where there's these high rise blocks. You know, if we can actually get in there, we can resolve this problem for those leaseholders. We can release millions of people who feel they're trapped and frustrated. So, you know, there's lots of ways in how you define levelling up. You know, Leveling up could be around education skills and where, you know, you're actually doing an apprenticeship that leads to a real job as opposed to something that, you know, just allows somebody to make some money off the back of you and then you have to go and do something else to get a job. So it's how you define leveling up. And as a what you call a blue collar conservative, I define everything through the prism of how's this going to help that family? How's this going to help that kid from that estate get on and make it in his life? And that's how I define leveling up. So I don't care if the white paper's delayed, if at the end of it, once it's delivered, it delivers for those families. Well, Stephen McPartland, uh, MP for Stephen, is Tory MP, and the, the government's canary in the mine on issues affecting working class communities. Thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure, Chris. Thank you. Stephen McPartland there. Now it's January, and many of us have used this time of the year to vow to change our lifestyle and commit to more exercise and maybe fewer chocolate coins. Most of us, if we're honest, will last roughly until this weekend. But would you be more inclined to stick to a healthier routine if you were rewarded with vouchers or even free cinema tickets? It's a scheme that the government is about to road test in Wolverhampton. So I asked Sir Keith Mills, the government's obesity czar, into the Red Lion pub to find out more. 
And listeners, a small warning. The Red Lion is a distinguished older pub, so please do excuse Sir Keith's ever so slightly squeaky chair. Sir Keith Mills, welcome to the Red Lion Pub and to Chopper's Politics Podcast. I'm very pleased to be here, although the uh, taxi driver did scratch his head when I asked <laughs> to go to a pub at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> why obesity? Well, why, why is this new challenge? You're the guy who helped deliver the Olympic Games. You're behind the, the, the nectar card points at, at um, various supermarkets and garages. You're behind air miles. Why are you tackling obesity? Well, I got approached about a year ago by government. They had... I guess six months into COVID, concluded that a problem that had been a problem for many years in this country and and most other countries, which was obesity, uh, was really exacerbated through COVID. I mean, many of the people in hospital were those that were the the least fit, the most overweight. Uh, And so somewhere in government, I, I imagine in number 10, someone decided to start looking at innovative ways of trying to tackle this problem. You know, it costs the country over six billion a year, and it's going to bring the health service to its knees in 10 years. Mm. And just throwing clinical solutions at it, as opposed to trying to get to the source of the problem, was was the brief in number 10. I, I understand it before I was involved. And they had a look around the world and came across a couple of programs that were using a very innovative marketing tool to try and change behavior. And the program in Singapore was asking the public in Singapore to sign up to a program Uh, encouraging them to change their behaviour in terms of uh, both diet and healthy eating and in terms of uh, exercise. And if they did that, they would be rewarded. So I got a call from number 10 asking if if I thought it was a good idea and worth trying. And I had a look at it and thought it certainly was. And so for the last year, we've been planning to put in place a new programme in the UK, uh, which kicks off the first quarter of this year. Mm. So-called sloucher vouchers. (laughs) But this is, um, so it's free cinema tickets shopping vouchers theme park entries and what that's connected to losing weight it's not losing weight per se and when we talk about obesity we're talking about two-thirds of the population that are overweight and or lead a sedentary lifestyle and ultimately that creates a huge range of medical issues from diabetes to heart disease and what we're encouraging people to do is to join the program improve their physical activity and if that means simply walking to the shops that's fine if they want to join a gym that's fine too or uh, join any one of a number of programs and improve their their diet and how can you improve that you've done that yeah through the technology in shops these days you can identify what people are buying and if they're buying healthy things you can reward them they'll be given a little fitbit type uh, wearable uh, which counts the steps but if they're joining a gym or doing a couch to 5k or whatever they're doing they get points essentially and those points can be redeemed for literally anything that they want from and the business case in government is it, it, it takes the pressure off the NHS further it, down, down, down well, the that, line the pennies finally dropped in government that prevention is better than cure you know it's a lot uh, less expensive investing in preventative measures than it is dealing with the consequences and actually you could say that across many areas in government yeah. dealing with the consequences of obesity is yeah. extremely expensive if the, if we can make this work it will be a long-term tool for government uh, so if, if you can if you can find a formula that works then there's no reason why government couldn't use the same formula to get the public more engaged in other healthy things vaccinations right now well on that very point i was going to ask that question do you think there should be a degree of reward to try and get to these stubborn unvaccinated groups which the pm talked about this week we're seeing aren't we in some other countries free like beer offered and entries to i think for lotteries and all sorts of things being offered to get people to the door i i I think there's a there's a very fine line between a sort of bribing people to do things and rewarding them and I mean I I, I certainly think you could provide rewards for people that take uh, a vaccine but I I wouldn't just restrict it to right now and this if this works it should work over decades and you'll remember I don't know whether you do remember but 20-30 years ago when the government decided to tackle smoking you know over 50 percent of the population smoked then and it was a massive problem and it needed fixing and to their credit government have invested in education and legislation and taxation and other things and now smoking is down less than 15 percent but it's taken 25 or 30 years so how would you do it with vaccinations and you 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 would just say maybe cinema tickets for first jab or no i think i I don't i don't think you make it that so there's a difference between 
a promotion and uh, one of these long-term programs. And what we're talking about is long-term behavior change. So we're not just saying, do this, get that. We're saying, change your behavior and, you, and you'll get some benefit. Mm. And that's, uh, that's what we're trialing in Wolverhampton. What's it costing to, to do in Wolverhampton and what might the benefit be? Is there a number out there? <clears throat> well, the, the budget for the trial was uh, £6 million and about um, four million of that will go back to the public in terms of paying for rewards, cinema tickets and discounts and other things. Off the back of this trial, we'll build an economic model. When I run Nectar programs and AirMars and other programs all over the world, we build very, very detailed economic models. The great thing about these programs is you know exactly what people are doing. And so you can forecast exactly what the return's gonna be. And if we get this right, there should be a very positive ROI. As a businessman, do you think, do you feel comfortable being part of a government program to do this isn't isn't uh, losing weight fitness really a personal choice matter so just eat less food walk more is how you lose weight and why is the government involved in that well i think the government's involved in the health of the nation and this is costing the taxpayer billions and billions of pounds every year so i i mean I absolutely think that this is something the government should concern itself with and actually as, as a principle it's nothing to do with this program but as a principle i think government should spend more money on prevention across the board than it does on dealing with the consequences and this is a good example of course you do many things keith mills one of which is you're running um, a rival bid for the to run the national lottery are you going to win i think we have a very good chance uh, camelot have had uh, the contract for the uh, National Lottery for 27 years. Um, since the beginning? Actually, since the beginning. <laughs> and it has, the National Lottery has been phenomenally successful. £45 billion pounds to good causes. And I, I've lost count of how many billions have gone into the Exchequer. So it's an incredibly successful uh, formula. Uh, but I happen to think that it's time for a change. It's lost visibility, definitely. It's not seen in the same way it was. I know it's lost its BBC primetime programme. It really has much. lost millions and millions of customers. And, and whereas at the beginning of the last licence, I don't know, 60 plus percent of the population played, now 40 plus percent play. And I just think that it's time for a change. New technology, new ideas, new marketing. It is a fantastic institution that needs to continue to grow. Will you bring back one pound for a ticket? <laughs> that was the mistake, I think, that they made at Camelot. Well, it, you know, I can't say that. Because you can't we, say it? Why not? Well, we have some rules. Okay, The, the, the Gambling Commission, there's the regulator for this competition to have some rules. And the rules are that we can't criticise the National Lottery and we can't criticise... Uh, Camelot, and we certainly can't reveal what's in our bid. So no. I'd love to tell you. But Even though I there's can't. a public interest, possibly, in knowing, <laughs> knowing information, what's the offer? I think so too, but I have to abide by the rules, and, and that's, what, uh, that's what we have to do, uh, sadly. Bring back the excitement, maybe, for the weekly draw or the twice weekly draw. Uh, I mean, that's I, what we're missing. I, I, again, I can't tell you what, no, what you our, <laughs> our plans. Uh, all I can say is we think it needs to be relaunched yeah. and it needs a fresh operator, and that's what we bid for. And in about six to eight weeks time we'll know who the who's going to uh, take up the next 10-year contract well sir keith mills best of luck with that and and also perhaps best of luck even more so with this uh, interesting plan to get us all fitter thanks for joining us this week on choppers politics thank you no you're very welcome well i would love to hear your thoughts on whether those measures mentioned by sir keith might get you onto the treadmill or perhaps you think it's not up to the government to be involved in our fitness levels let me know. Email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet me at chopperspodcast. And as a little New Year treat, why not give yourself a Telegraph subscription if you haven't got one already? You can get your first month completely free of charge by going to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. And if that whets your appetite for more political analysis, why not sign up for my newsletter? It's called, not surprisingly, Chopper's Politics. It delivers all the latest Westminster gossip straight into your email inbox every weekday. The link to sign up is in the show notes to this episode. Thank you to my guests, Steve McPartland MP, Sir Keith Mills, and of course, Nigel Farage. And you can find a link to Nigel's piece for Telegraph this week about his view on reform and the so-called blue wall seats in the show notes to this episode. Thank you to my producers, Giles Gear, Louisa Wells, and of course, Theo Luludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. Finally, if you can, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. You won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio!